everybody. My name is Dan Peterson. Uh, I happen to be at Google, but we're here to talk about Apache Shindig. Um, so just to scope this talk here, I'll start off uh, introducing what Shindig is, as well as the scope and goals of the project. And then I uh, welcome Chris Chabot up to speak to the concepts of what Shindig does in the server farms, as well as give the status of the PHP code base. Um, and then Paul Linder will come up and speak to uh, what, it, what it means and what it takes to run Shindig at massive production, like he's doing at High Five, as well as give an update on the Java code base. And then I'll come back and end it out with a demo, and then we'll have some time for a Q&A and info about how to get involved. So Shindig itself is uh, a project that it, the goal is to let lots of containers get up and running with open social apps. What does it mean to be an open social container? Um, so when open social was first introduced back in November, uh, there was a lot of interest in being able to build these, these applications that would let users engage more on the web. Um, but it wasn't entirely clear how other websites would be able to host these applications. And that's what Shindig is. Shindig is a project, actually it was suggested to be part of Apache Incubator, the Apache Software Foundation Incubator um, by some folks over at Ning, and it seemed like a very good idea, a great way to get an open source reference implementation out there for lots of sites to be able to use and work on together. Looking at the actual architecture of Shindig, there are three main components. Um, number one is the gadget server. For those of you who have used something like iGoogle before, um, you might be a little familiar with this concept. So iGoogle um, has a lot of the, the sort of third-party built widgets um, on top of the, the personalized homepage there. And those little boxes are actually iframes, it turns out. Those iframes are filled with content that was written by third-party developers. That content is actually just uh, normal JavaScript and HTML that is wrapped in an XML file. And that XML file is managed and sort of compiled in some sense by the gadget server and injected into the iframe for users to be able to play with. So that's one piece of Shindig. Um, another piece is, is the Open Social data server. This is a fairly obvious component given what Open Social is, but Open Social uh, needs to be connected to the various backends, say it was MySpace, say it is High Five, say it is Orkut, and they all have their backends and their user, users laid out in different ways, but the Open Social API is a very common uh, as a common API that they can map to. So the RESTful API is actually something that is just coming out as part of Open Social 0.8, which allows non-JavaScript access for, for the Open Social data. And that's something that's in progress in the Shindig code base. The third piece of the Shindig architecture is the gadget container JavaScript. And this is actually more on the, sort of the, the sample offering of UI that you might want to use if you are a container looking to implement some of these functions. So looking at it from a, from a diagram perspective, um, you have the, the, the basic situation here is that the, the gadget server is what does the rendering and can pull in the social data as appropriate and inject that into the gadget. And so you have these gadgets that are shown on your site. Um, Chris will jump in a little deeper into this a little later. Um, thinking now about why you might want to use Shindig. So Shindig itself, the, the most important reason you'd want to use Shindig is that it's an open source community building this, building this reference implementation of this open standard. This open source community means that there's a high, high value code, and actually, I, I've called it a reference implementation many times now, um, but it's actually production quality reference implementation, and that's not always uh, one in one. And there's actually a lot of sites that are already using Shindig in production, and I'll give you a, a list a little later. Um, but this code is definitely ready for scale. Another point is that open social itself is still evolving over time, and as open social evolves, that specification is changing. And if lots of people are working together to build this implementation, you can all sort of build off of each other and build a, a better ecosystem. And Shindig will allow you to more easily stay in sync with the latest and greatest. Uh, another sort of more speculative piece is the, this integration with Kaha, which actually currently is, is Java only. Kaha is, a, is sort of a, a separate, is definitely a separate project from Apache Shindig, but Kaha aims to address some of the security and performance problems related to using lots of iframes and using untrusted JavaScript. And there's, there's already some integration to have those two work together. So looking at the Shindig community, I said it's a very big community. You can definitely see here that in the last six months, we've already had you know, nearly 5,000 emails. So there's a lot of people out there that can help, uh, whether they happen to be committers or, or are also just contributors sending patches. There's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of activity. Looking at the repository status, um, so Shindig itself is open source 0.7 compliant. And there's work going on now to get up to speed on 0.8. Um, and actually, one of the biggest things is 0.8 is, is introducing the RESTful API, which is already functioning in read-only mode um, in the Shindig code base out of the box. 
So Shindig itself, I, I called it language neutral. Um, and what that means is that we have uh, two ports right now, one in Java, one in PHP, um, both of which are 0 0.7 compliant. And then the really important part is that the JavaScript container, they, they both use the same JS. So there's not duplicate code there. And so it, it works together much, much more cleanly. Um, so looking ahead, so actually to pull some stats, there we go. Um, to pull some stats from uh, actually OLO.net, which does some project tracking, uh, you can see you can actually build off of uh, eight years of effort, according to the bot, um, for a project that's only been around six months. So there's a, there's a lot of code there, and there's a lot of momentum. Looking at where we're at from a production perspective, so High Five, Hives, iGoogle, NetLog, Orkut, that's a lot of users that are being touched through this shindig code in production right now. Um, and there's actually a lot of others that are coming up to speed to look at either either more Java or also in PHP. Um, they just haven't yet quite shipped. So with that, actually, I'd like to op uh, open it up to Chris Chabot, who's going to speak to some of the uh, concepts behind Shindig. Thank you. <coughs> oh, hello, everyone. I'm Chris Chabot, and I'm the author of the PHP version of Shindig. And I wanted to run through the status of the project and pretty much what the basis of Shindig is. So I just wanted to get the status out of the way so I can talk about Shindig in general. Uh, we recently, in the last couple of weeks, finished 0 0.7 specification support. That means it's now completely ready, the PHP version, to run all the popular gadgets and be used in production and the first sandboxes using PHP Shindig will be going live soon. And there's also a little side project that I made. It's called Pertusa. Um, Pertusa is an example social network site written in PHP that's database driven and has all the little UI components that you need to make your own so social site as open social container. So it serves as an example of some source code that you can look at to get a feel for how it works just by looking at a practical example of it. Uh, the name Pertusa is actually a little bit of a pun. Uh, as you may or may not know, Shindix is American slang for party. And Partusa is Argentinian slang for party as well. So you can see there's some connection between the two. Yeah. So PHP Shindig, adaptation is going really well. We'll have four mainstream social network sites using it, which means there'll be over 100 million people using PHP Shindig on their day-to-day -day affairs. Uh, Goo from Japan will be going li live later this year. Uh, the others are going to do their own announcements somewhere in this summer because uh, they like to keep that to themselves. Uh, we also have free social network frameworks, and those are people who create applications that you can use to make your own social network site. So it's a little bit like a content management system, but then specifically for social sites. Uh, the nice thing is they'll be rolling out their new versions later this summer, which means we'll have hundreds of new open social containers going live this year. Uh, there's a lot of parties already contributing code to PHP Shindig as well. Globant is in the audience here today with us. Uh, they're contributing a lot, and we've got a couple of people in Japan and all over the world finding bugs, helping to fix them, contributing code to them. So the community aspect of Shindig is going really well on the PHP side as well. So Dan already touched on this slide a little bit, and I'd like to go in a little bit more detail. Uh, what you have is a website. It's probably a social network site, but it could be any site that you want to have components in that have some social functionality. So some developer out there created a gadget, right? And he put that online. It's an XML file, and you want to be able to show that in your website. So what you need for it is a gadget serve and a social data serve, and I'd like to talk a little bit about what those components do. So first of all, there's the gadget serve. And the gadget serve, you've got an XML file online. That XML file has a bit of HTML code, it has a bit of JavaScript code, and it's got some other information in there. And you want to get that on your website, right? So Shindig downloads that XML file for you. It looks at the contents of it, and it retrieves information such as who the offer is, who you can email for support, uh, what thumbnail you probably want to show in your application gallery on your website. So it takes all that metadata. Then it looks at some other information in the XML file, which is the translations. Translations are incredibly important because, as was said earlier by Patrick in a different session, social network sites don't really pick their users. The users pick their social network site. And that means that you probably have visitors from tens or twenties or thirties of countries going to your site, and they all pretty much want to see content in their own language, probably. So it looks at the XML file, and it sees, hey, there's some translation packs here. It takes those translation packs and it tries to match them to the preference of the user. 
So if you speak English and you're from America, it will use that language pack. But if you're from France and you speak French, then it will use that language pack. And it replaces language tags in the content of the gadget with the localized versions of it. It also injects those translations into the JavaScript space so that if the gadget uses the open social JavaScript API, it can reach those messages as well for things like displaying custom errors, messages, etc. The next step is the preferences. Now, gadgets have preferences that you want to be able to set in your open social container. Uh, for instance, say that you have a horoscope gadget, you would want to select which sign it should display. And if you have a delicious gadget, I presume most of you know delicious, uh, you'll probably want to select which user you want to display the bookmarks of. So it takes those preferences and does the same kind of variable substitution on the gadget content and injects it in the API space through JavaScript as well so that the gadget knows what sign to display, basically. Then there's features. Now, features are JavaScript libraries. And what's so important about features? Uh, a gadget wants to do certain things in your social network site. For instance, there's the views feature. And the views feature allows you to navigate to different views of a gadget. And you probably already know that a gadget can have a home view. That's the personal page where the owner's the same as the viewer. You've got a profile view. And the profile view is how other people will see your identity, your page on the social site. So you want to be able to navigate between those two by clicking on a link. And the views feature would provide that functionality. Uh, another big feature would be open social, which provides you with the functionality to retrieve things like your friends, your information, your name, etc. Now, these features, what's special about them is that they're injected into the actual iframe of the gadget. Uh, the reason why we chose for that, instead of making the external JavaScript files, is to reduce the perceived latency that the end user will have on the website. Uh, the problem with external JavaScript files is that it takes a little while before they're all downloaded and it all becomes available. So you can't really do any JavaScript logic in the gadget until all your external resources have finished loading and your unload event will be called. That means some cases when some of the images or whatever files uh, take a few seconds to come in, the gadget is just sitting there without actually doing something. So all the JavaScript that it is generated by the features is put into that HTML file inline, which means there's no actual delay before it starts executing. We do have some JavaScript minification in there, and with gzip compression, it means that your gadget document is actually not that big at all. It'd be about 50K uncompressed, and compressed would be like 20 kilobytes per gadget. So at the end of all of this, the end result is the HTML file. And that's the HTML file that gets put into the iframe. So that's the actual working gadget on your site. Now, we have a special service as well. As you know, at the moment, as Dan already said, we've got the Java and the PHP versions. So what if you wrote your website in a different language? Suppose that you like Perl and you wrote your website in that, or you made your website in Python, C Sharp, et cetera and you still want to be an open social container. Well, the metadata service allows you to do that. Uh, you can put Shindig on a different server, just as is. You can pick the Java version. You can pick the PHP version. And then through a post request, you say, well, here's a gadget, and this is the user that wants to see it. And here's his preferences and his language and all those things. And then Shindig will return to you all the information that you need to know. So it will give you all the metadata that we discussed earlier. It will give you the thumbnail URLs. And it will give you a little iframe URL that you can just kind of glue into your website. And that will refer back to Shindig. So everything works without having to pull in the entire project into your site. Uh, the other alternative, of course, is to port Shindig to a different language. And I don't think we'd mind if someone did. <laughs> we always like more languages to support. So the second part of Shindig is the social data server. Now, when we're talking about social information, uh, I think most of you will know that we're talking about three different kinds of information normally. There's the people, and the people are the profile informations. There's things like your name, your email addresses, uh, the picture to show whenever you're referring to this person. And there's the relationship between those people, the friends in most social network sites. Then there's the activities. Activities are created by the events that happen, uh, the interactions that people do on a social network site. For instance, uh, in your books that I've read, you say, hey, I'm now reading this great book. That will go into your activity stream. And your friends will see that as well. Hey, Chris is reading this great book. Maybe I'll check it out as well. And so activities are a very important part of the whole social experience as well. Now, the data server also provides persi persistent data storage for gadgets. Now, 
there's a downside to using persistent data, and that means that's a little bit limited in how big the information is you can store in there. I think ORCID has a limit of about 10 kilobytes. Uh, so there's some limits, but it has the big advantage, first of all, that you can write a gadget, uh, put the XML file on some free hosting somewhere like pages.google.com or any of the other hosting sites, uh, and you use the persistent data for storing things like, well, what are the birthdays of my friends because I happen to deal a lot with birthdays, or what are the high scores of a game? So you don't need any uh, infrastructure of your own to be able to have an actual working gadget on social network sites, which is great if you don't have the money for it or you don't know how to write such a server, etc. Another thing it's used for is to cut down on the latency. Uh, often you'll have your server in a certain country, but people from other countries might not have such a fast connection to it. So by storing that information on the social network site container, uh, the cross trip to retrieve that information is really fast. So the data server. The gadgets need to talk to it, so they need to be in the same domain. And the gadget domain or the social data server domain is actually different than a container. We'll get back to why it's really important. They're currently using a JSON wire format to communicate all the social information with the gadget. But as Dan has already said, we're switching over to a RESTful protocol soon. And that's really exciting, not just from a gadget perspective, but it means that application developers have a few new opportunities to develop cool applications. Like, for instance, if you have an external site and you still want to pull in a friend list and say, this is what your friends thought about this product, or this is their review about this movie, etc., that RESTful interface will allow external parties to interact with the Shindig social information. And the gadgets are going to be using the same protocol pretty soon, too. So using Shindig, this is kind of like the mini to-do list of the things that you need to go through before you can become an open social container. So you first need to connect the social data server to your own database. It needs to know where to get the information from, right? Then you need to add gadgets to your site. Well, to add gadgets to your site, you need to do a couple things. First of all, you need to include some JavaScript libraries for the RPC, Remote Procedure Call. Uh, you need to add the fi physical gadgets to the page. You probably have some user interface where people can pick gadgets that they want to show on their page. So you need to create all the iframes for the gadget on those pages. And you need to add user interface bits like an application gallery and other management settings, configurations. So to go into detail about the data server, I'm going to show this, inf uh, this example in PHP because I'm the author of the PHP version, so that's a bit easier for me. What you do is you create a class using this gadget data handler interface that Shindig knows how to use. Uh, then you open your config.php file and say, hey, I created a new class that I want you to use to retrieve all this information. And that's how you plug it into Shindig. So you extend that basic interface class and you implement a couple of functions. The first function you should implement is to shoot handle. Shindig supports you using multiple classes. So suppose you want to s separate out your information about people in one class and you want to have application data in another class and activity information in another class. You just enter multiple classes in your config file and every class returns a true or false if, well, this is the class that should handle that kind of information. Then there's the handle request class. Now that's where all the real magic happens. You get a request and the gadget batches up the request together because you don't want to have multiple round trips to your server. So it says, well, I want to retrieve information about the owner, I want to retrieve information about the owner friends, and I want to know something about the viewer as well. So those are three requests that end up on the Shindig data server, and for each of those requests, this function is called. Uh, in the request, in the parameters, you'll have the type, and the type will be one of those things that are defined up there. And from there, you take that type of request and say, I want to fetch people, and there's an ID spec that says, I want to know about the owner friends. Then you put in your logic there how to retrieve the owner's friends. Now, you return this in the predefined classes. For instance, the response item maps directly to the current JSON format, but the RESTful interface will use the same kind of classes. So as long as you use those base classes to wrap your information, it would just automatically get create, converted to the correct JSON format, which the gadgets will understand. And the same will go for the actual data response. So, so say that you want to return activities, you create a new activity class for every bit of activity information that you retrieve. 
you set things like the title, the stream title, the body, and the time that the activity was posted, and you return an array with those activity objects in it, which get translated into JSON, they get sent into a big response item to the gadget, and everything works. The other things you need to do, we talked about, is the RPC container JavaScript. Now, it's really important for security that the container and the gadgets are actually different domains. Uh, you don't want a malicious gadget that can go to your containing page and say, invite everybody to be my friend or steal my social security number or anything else. So we need to separate out access between those two. However, gadgets do want to be able to do certain things on the container, like changing the title in their title bar above the gadget. They want to resize the content area. They want to be a little bit bigger because they got some more information to show. So we need some kind of way for these two to communicate with each other, and that's what the RPC libraries are for. They're a secure communication protocol between the container and the gadgets, which the container then receives. They make sure that this is an actual request and it's all secure and everything checks out. And then the container JavaScript performs these requests that the gadget did. And you see here a little bit of a snippet of how you would put that RPC JavaScript in, in your containing page. And after that, you need to implement some actual JavaScript logic to do those things like setting a title or resizing the content. So we've got a couple of examples online here because I don't want to go too deeply into the code. However, we do have a code labs tomorrow. So if you want to see this in great detail, that would be a great time to go into it. I've got a couple of URLs here that you can go to to see this in practice live. Uh, the first one is a JavaScript driven example which is purely client side. If you look at that file, you'll see a couple of test gadgets. And if you look at the source of it, you'll see that there's a couple of lines of code to use the built-in JavaScript layout manager. We also have Partusa. Partusa is the live social network side example. You can find the code on the code.google.com page. It's the URL there. And we've got a live version of it running as well where you can see what it actually does and how it integrates with Shindig and how you put your iframes there, and et cetera, on partusa.shabbatc.com. Well, that's the end of my talk. And Paul Linder's next from High Five. Thanks, Chris. Great information on the PHP talk. So I'm going to go into a little bit uh, of a bit of a tangent here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Shindig, but I'm actually going to talk a little bit about High Five's experience and actually putting it into production. And uh, it's sort of a from the trenches kind of uh, view. Um, it's been spending the past like four months, five months, I can't even remember now, um, actually making Shindig work and making it work really, really well for millions and millions of users. So um, first thing, a little bit about Java Shindig. Um, Java Shindig was actually the first uh, code drop that, that hit, uh, well actually I'd, I'd say the Ning version of PHP was the first, but then the, the Java Shindig sh followed shortly thereafter. It, uh, it was actually based off of some of the iGoogle code. So it's actually really some really high quality production level code. Um, and uh, the Google engineers did a really good job of sort of clearing up all the intellectual property rights and everything else and, and rewriting stuff as necessary. So it's really, really, really good stuff. So um, currently it's actually running in, uh, production at Orchid and High Five, Netlog, iGoogle, and some other stuff coming real soon. There's also uh, another container that, that I don't think anyone has actually mentioned yet, but at Java 1 was talked about, which is a Sun social site. So that's going to be pretty cool. So, so Java Shindig, it's actually running really, really well, and it's a nice, good code. So what's in Java Shindig? Well, everything that Chris just talked about is actually available in uh, the Java version. So, and uh, so the metadata server that he talked about, which is used for to retrieving the data there, the gadget rendering. Um, the one thing that actually uh, we haven't actually mentioned yet, but which is actually a really big important part of, of Shindig 2 is the proxy server. So if you ever use JavaScript, you know it has a restriction. You can only contact the same host. So if you want to be able to contact your own app servers, you need to have this proxy server in place to actually do the, get the request to your back end as well. So, so Java, it has everything you need. And uh, I also want to highlight another thing about the Java implementation. The Java implementation is actually built on a number of open source technologies. Um, so we build everything with Maven. Um, if you want to customize it, we use Juice, which um, if you had the, I think it was in the room next door earlier today, so another great Google technology that's open source. Um, we use the, a, a bunch of Apache Commons libraries to actually make the Java code you know, really nice and clean. 
um, we're using OAuth. Uh, there's a pub the open source version of OAuth to actually do our uh, secure uh, requests to the back end. Some J JSON stuff, Jota time for performance. Uh, Abdera is, uh, is actually a really another interesting open source project that does all of the, uh, the, uh, the, the REST APIs that we're actually using in Joe.h. And of course, Kaha, and we use Jetty for actually running a sample service. So, so the, the ni nice thing is it's, so the, the core of Java, is the Shindig code is really focused on Shindig and then all these other pieces sort of come along and actually pr make it really, really good. So what's the first step if you wanna actually use it? I mean, there's actually a code lab that goes into this in more detail, but it's, it's really, really simple. The idea is you just need to check out the code. Um, you need to go into the, the trunk directory, which is you just checked out, run this Maven command, which builds everything, and then run it. So, I mean, within like less than five minutes, you can actually have it running off your laptop and in a test mode. And uh, in fact, the, the longest thing that it'll probably take is actually downloading the code from Apache using Subversion. So, so what, if, what if after that happens, what do you get? Well, here's what you get. Um, we'll, sh we'll see this in the demo section, but this is a built-in sample container. You can dump in any sort of uh, app XML file you want, and you can reload it. You can change like the different state of users. So it's a really nice place to uh, sort of test out applications, and also if you want to change Shindig around, um, it's a really good place to validate that the changes you made didn't break anything. Um, and then I'm really excited about this. This is, so in the most recent builds of Shindig, we also have full uh, read-only support for REST calls. So here's an example right here. Um, this is what the REST protocol looks like, and you can see I can just hit a localhost URL with social REST people. Here's, for example, here's like all of the entries that we have for John Doe, and you can see this is a nice JSON entry. You can also get Atom XML feeds, so it's, out of the box, it just works. So that's great. I mean, so you have a couple sample things. Um, what's next? Well, I mean, so if Shindig is this little punk of truck right here, that's, that's where we're starting from. It has a little bunch of sample data, a bunch of little sample basic interfaces. Well, we wanna go from this to this, which is the, the big monster truck that can haul dirt from here to infinity. So the, there's a number of things you have to do to actually make that transition. And that's um, what we ended up doing at High Five. So the, the basic steps are you need to integrate Shindig with your own data sources. And uh, Chris just talked a little bit about that and it, in a very elegant way, so I won't really repeat it that much, but um, I'll show you in a second how it, it works under Java. But the, the basic thing, you have to tie it into your own database um, or caching layer or services or whatever you use. And then the next thing is to, you need to actually make it, Shindig is sort of a container but to really make it into a platform, you're gonna have to mix in a bunch of other elements. So at High Five, we spent a lot of effort into making like a developer console, which is a way a developer can manage their applications. Um, we needed a way to uh, be able to, to do, uh, you know, update your app XML and manage various things. Um, and also an application gallery, so users can find the actual applications that they want. Um, and then finally, what we had to do is we had to do a lot of these things and actually all of the containers have had to do this, which is add caching and reduce latency. Because uh, when you're loading up a profile page that has you know, four or five different gadgets on it, there's a lot of different requests going to the back end. There's a lot of JavaScript. There's a lot of different requests going back and forth. So um, it's, it's, since Shindig is, is a really big component of that, the, the less latency it has and the faster it runs, then that really affects page load times for the user. So. We actually spent a lot of time on that, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we faced in actually doing that. So, so let's talk a little bit about integration. So, so Chris showed how to, to write a, a PHP class. Well, Java has the same kind of thing. Java has interfaces, and, uh, and Shindig Java version actually supports a, a large number of interfaces. So we have some of these same kind of interfaces that you saw in the PHP version. So if you wanna talk about you know, being able to map to your own um, user's database, you got the people service. If you want to hit your own activity stream, same thing, activity service. And the persistent data, again, data service. Um, the basics of it are you, you, uh, you implement those interfaces. You write a juice module, which says this interface, this implementation maps to this interface. And then Shindig will use that information to automatically configure itself and bootstrap itself to use your particular implementation. Um, and, and the great thing, too, is that, that uh, Everyone working on, on Shindy realized that everyone has a little bit of, you know, um, ways they want to customize it. So we have a whole bunch of other things too. So like security tokens, fetching content, um, caching, 
gadget blacklist. So all those things are included in the Java version of Shindig, and uh, you can ex you can customize it and extend it and make it you know all your own. So really good stuff there. And uh, so let's just take a quick look. I mean, this is a, a just a really simple sample of a Java class that implements a people service. So you can see it's it's very similar to the the PHP version. Um, and that you have uh, like a get people call and it takes like a number of different parameters. It's like a list of IDs, a sort order, a filter, things like that. So it's really, it's really quite simple. You just sort of, in this case, like we have a very naive implementation here where it just says, give me everyone from my particular data layer and then just return it. So very simple. And let's, so once you've got that, then you have to actually need to configure it. Here's a very, a very small, simple juice module. You bind your people service class to your my people service, and then you configure it using your web XML, and then launch your server, and boom, it's using your own version of people data. So that's one th the first part, which is customizing it for your environment. Well, what do you got to do next? Well, I already mentioned a couple things, but the uh, so if you're if you're a social network, you might have some of these things, but you might not actually have some of these things. Um, so you're going to need a place to store application data when you when you build your social site, which means you probably need a database table that has all the applications that you are allowing or whitelisting, things like that. So we did that. Um, you need a place to store user app permissions. That's a really important thing that um, you need to honor the user's request for security, but you need a way to persist that. So that's one of the other things that you're probably going to need to do right off the bat is uh, put it like a, in our case, we have an app perms table that maps users to applications and what applications are allowed to do or not do is based on that. Um, you need to ma maintain your list of developers. So again, you have a list of developers stored in a table, stored in some data s source somewhere. So we did that. Um, if you want to support notifications in your open social uh, platform, then you're gonna need to actually make a table for that or reuse some existing uh, notifications mechanism. I'd probably recommend separating out app notifications from you know, person-to-person -person notifications. I think we found that, that our users appreciated that a lot. And then finally, there's another aspect of open social. You can actually invite another user to use your an application. So you need a way to have to store an invitation in a database somewhere. So, so that's uh, another component that you'll need to add. And then, of course, you need to make it look good. So if users won't use it unless it actually integrates well with your app, so you need to make a, cal a gallery, a canvas, a way to do invites, a way to browse notifications, all that stuff. So once you actually go through all of these separate pieces, which are sort of layered on top of Shindig, then you're actually really talking about a platform <laughs> with a high-speed train. So, so we did all that. That worked really well. We got a sandbox out. Developers started using it. They thought it was great. Um, so then the next thing comes is, okay, we've got applications that want to install to millions of people. We've got proxy requests going left and right. Um, what are we going to do to make that stuff work? So the first thing that you have to do is if, if uh, and this is sort of, I don't know, this is sort of like web application 101, I know, but it's, uh, the basics of it are, so um, Shindig is a very highly, threat, uh, highly threaded type of thing. It has lots of small connections, which is, you know, kind of a paramount of Ajax type of thing. So you need to be able to really turn around the request fast. So um, if you have any concurrency issues in your code, fix them. And then, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna hit concurrency issues in user libraries and things like that, and then you're gonna have to work around those. And I'll, I'll give you some gotchas in a sec. But uh, we had ended up hitting a lot of those. Um, and then the other thing is make sure everything runs really, really fast. So if you're getting a list of friends, make sure it's the fastest possible way to get a list of friends. You know, try to avoid using a disk drive if at all possible because that in introduces lots and lots of latency. And uh, so for example, like at High Five, we, we pre-populate memory caches with the most heavily used types of requests. So every, those types of things run in constant time. And again, cache, cache, cache. So, so at, at, for our particular implementation, we used a content delivery uh, network, which is, in our particular case, is Akamai, although there are plenty of others around there. And uh, we also make sure we set the, the caching headers so the browser caches as much as possible. So caching, it's what it, it cures what ails you. And uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about latency and concurrency. So, so this was probably our server about, I don't know, right when we launched. So <laughs> we, lots of traffic sort of all coming to these choke points. So um, we ended up doing a lot of things in the Java, on the Java side. We actually 
had to do a bit of JVM tuning. We had to make sure that we didn't actually incur any large pauses. We actually had to like really push a lot of traffic through these things to make sure that that we could find all these these issues that happen only under load. Um, we even found some some oddball things in Java itself. So like the Java cryptography extensions and locale and character set handling, they don't scale at all. <laughs> They're really bad. So we actually ended up having to um, you know do like thread local caches for a lot of that stuff. And again, if you're doing anything in Java that you requires any sort of concurrency, you have to make sure you use something like a concurrent hash map so that it's, it works across many, many threads. And what happened? Well, that's what happened. A nice graph that goes up and to the right. So um, if you look at the actual traffic, these numbers are actually a little old and they're actually, we're actually doing much more than this right now. But um, so you can say like we're about more like 14,000 requests per second on the edge going up even higher than that, about 10,000 at the origin. So our, our servers are handling 10,000 requests per second at peak. Um, so one of the big things that I mentioned was the proxy earlier on. So we ended up having a lot of problems with the, the, the proxy code in, uh, in Shindig. So we ended up rewriting it ourselves. Um, there's a, a library out there called uh, Commons HTTP Client, and it's actually used by LimeWire. So uh, it's actually kind of apropos because uh, the Shindig servers are getting hit with the, the force of like, you know, 10 colleges worth of BitTorrent downloaders. So um, this stuff seemed to work really well. And uh, we actually sent that out to the mailing list for anyone else who wants to use it. And we'll probably end up finding its way into the code base. Um, the, the work we did on caching work, it paid off really well. Um, of those requests, about 75% of them actually cached. And that doesn't even count the browser cache. And, you know, we've got hundreds of apps, thousands of developers, 30 billion hits per month. And, and it's all supported actually only on a single rack of servers. So. Um, that's pretty amazing considering the, the, the number of servers we have for everything else and also the, uh, just the, the insane amount of traffic that it delivers. So with that, I'm, let's, I'm going to bring up, uh, let's bring Chris and Dan up here and let's do some demos. Thanks, Paul. So yeah, I wanted to take a minute here to, to walk through what it looks like for Shindig to be running. And so the first thing I'll do is bring up um, just vanilla shindig out of the box. And this actually right here is just a gadget running with no sort of uh, wrapper around it. Um, and you can see that, hey, it works. It renders. You can play with it. Um, I'm not too familiar with Macs, but I'll type anyway. Uh, Dutch keyboard, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, in any case, so, so th this is shindig. It, it rendered a gadget. You can see the gadget URL here. Um, and. The, the next thing I want to show is actually the, the sample container um, directly out of, oh, I copy and pasted the URL wrong. Yeah. The, uh, so this here is the sample container. And this is the sample container that you will get uh, as Shindig out of the box. And what's going on here is that the, the title, the, the block inside the title, that is um, the iframe is what you want to think about there. This container itself is intended to be uh, more along the lines of what you would use for testing your, your app or your gadget to see what it does with a very variety of, of social parameters, whether the viewer is John Doe or, or Jane Doe, for example. Um, and so if we, we keep looking, if we keep going, uh, so we can change this to, to Jane Doe. Well, actually, George Doe is probably a better example. And so there was a little bit of change there in terms of exactly what was going on. Th this particular app, we call it Social Hello World. All it really does is lets you um, say hello in a ver and it will change the language over time. Um, so you can see that the language down there at the bottom is saying hello world in yet a different language. Um, and, you, and the basic idea is that there's a relationship between Jane and Joe sort of built into Shindig itself just as test data. Um, and you can also sort of see what some of this stuff looks like but again, we're, we're getting a little deep now on exactly what's going on, and there's actually going to be a code lab tomorrow, 10:15, uh, to really help everybody get up to speed running Shindig. So to keep going on some other folks that are using Shindig, I wanted to pull up the, the Netlog site, which is actually just going to beta launch today um, for all of their English users. And so if we keep going, you can look at the Netlog Open Social Sandbox, and I will sign in. <laughs> oh. Dutch keyboard. Uh huh. <laughs> That's painful. Tab. I won't save it here. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> My bad, sorry. Shift? Quora? Shift. Yeah, that's a shift. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine in the Netherlands a shift key looks completely different than in the rest of the world. So <laughs> clearly I have done it wrong. I have a login. Yeah, I'll try please. It. <laughs> oh crap! <laughs> That's, who put that till the key there? But he actually uses the Mac, it turns out. So it must be the Dutch thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if this works. Da -da 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 -da. Challenge. Yay. Yes. Sweet. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So this is running actually the compliance gadget to make sure that. That open so that uh, netlog is implemented open social and as you can see uh, it's still rendering a little bit come on go 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 what's going on so the this URL up here uh, sorry this URL up here is the URL for uh, actually a, an app itself that helps make sure that um, a, a variety of containers all implement the same API and uh, I just <laughs> think the RPC thing is oh no this is the Firefox 3. Oh, Beta. right. <laughs> we should not have been using that. <laughs> okay, well, so... It, believe me, it works. <laughs> can we pull it into a different browser? You can use there's Safari if you want. Safari down. But uh, Actually, there, there's some really cool stuff in, in uh, Firefox 3, and I don't know if anyone got to the HTML5 presentation, but the Talk. RPC between gadget and container is, is very, very efficient uh, between the two in HTML5. So, Anyway. Oh, I get to log in again. Oh, actually, somebody was already logged in previously. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. Yay. All right, so now you can see the results of what the compliance gadget shows. Um, and the basic idea here is that uh, developers can look at this to see, hey, NetLog actually supports everything they're supposed to support, um, which is good for um, dealing with lots of containers if you want to get your apps to have lots of reach. Uh, so to jump a little deeper, we'll go to Orkut now, which is live. So this is Orkut, um, is one of the earlier containers that has shipped to a lot of users already. Um, <laughs> it says it's loading. It's the, the <laughs> typical demo problem, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you have to tell a funny joke then, I think. <laughs> What's your funny joke? Me? Something with a Murphy Law <laughs> reference, maybe? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Otherwise, maybe you can show high five. <laughs> I hear high five is a, a really popular social network. Yeah, I hear that'll work. Ah, it's logged in. Yeah, logged in. Chris, Chris is already logged in. Does Chris have any apps is the question. Uh, I like. Ah, uh, yes, of course. So every, everyone at, after this, go on, on to high five, sign in, and give Chris a hug. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> or dedicate a song to him. Right, so you can see here I like is running on, uh, on high five. And it can just you in the Canvas view, and you can click around and see what concerts are coming up for the bands that mm -hmm. Chris cares about. And look at the performance. <laughs> it's stunning. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing I wanted to show was actually uh, what Chris had talked about a little bit. You can use that login if you want. Which is the Pertusa site. Pertusa itself is not actually formally part of Shindig, but it's a very good, um, again, a, a reference of what people can use for the social networks if they want to build some common, common UI components to really show what Shindy can do. Uh, it's cool. worth noting, by the way, that Pertusa was licensed under the Apache license as well. So you can pretty much just copy any code you want to, rip it over, and use it in your own site. And we have a Horoscopes app in here. And so it turns out Chris the wasn't actually born settings. then. Chris is actually a Pisces. He just got confused previously. <laughs> um, so I will go ahead and change his birthday on him. You're a Pisces too, though. <laughs> uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. So that's the demo of what Shindy does out of the box. Uh, and the, the last thing just to wrap up is, so there's some docs available on the Shindig website uh, hanging out the incubator site, and that, that'll help you get up and, up and running on Java and PHP, and certainly you're more than welcome to get involved on Shindig Dev, uh, as well as come to the Code Lab tomorrow. Um, of course, Patch is welcome. Yes. And with that, uh, any Q&A, we'd yeah. be happy to do it. There's yeah, a mic mics. there in the middle. Yeah, there's actually one over there, too. Oh, what do you know? So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.